We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Loretta J. Ross is an activist on women's issues including reproductive freedom, human rights, and opposition to hate groups and right-wing organizations. Women's human rights are of particular concern for Ross because she was sterilized at age 23. Loretta is currently the national coordinator of Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Health Collective, a network founded in 1997 of 70 women of color and allied organizations that work on reproductive health issues. In the 1970s, Ross was one of the first African-American women to direct a rape crisis center. In the 1980s, she served as director of Women of Color Programs for NOW, the National Organization for Women, organizing the first national conference on women of color and reproductive rights in 1987. She successfully organized women of color delegations for the massive pro-choice marches NOW, sponsored in 1986 and 1989. And in 2004, she was national co-director of the March for Women's Lives in Washington, D.C., the largest protest march in U.S. history with more than one million participants. From 1990 to 1995, Loretta served as National Program Research Director for the Atlanta-based Center for Democratic Renewal. She directed projects on far-right organizations in South Africa, the Ku Klux Klan, and neo-Nazi involvement in anti-abortion violence in the U.S. Following this, she founded the National Center for Human Rights Education, a training and resource center for grassroots activists. This organization works to bridge the gaps between social justice movements, encouraging activists to move through the singularity of identity politics to all inclusive politics based on the commonality of our humanity. She is co-author of the book Undivided Rights, Women of Color Organizing for Reproductive Justice. Ross is currently writing a book on reproductive rights entitled Black Abortion. For the last two years, she has also been collecting oral histories of elder feminists for, of color for archives at Smith College. In 2003, Loretta received an honorary doctorate of civil law degree from Arcadia University. Hello and welcome to the Global Feminisms Project. I'm Zakia Luna, a graduate student in sociology and women's studies, and I'm here with Loretta Ross. Thank you for coming today. Thanks for having me. So first we're going to talk about your background to discuss the areas around which you've been active. Then we'll talk about your vision for the future and you know, we'll talk for about an hour. Sound good? Sounds good to me. Great. So first, can you tell us a bit about your background, um, where you grew up, and if there were sort of any significant events that, looking back, sort of helped lead you onto this path? Well, I'm from a military family. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like the classic military brat moving around every 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. My father's an immigrant from Jamaica, mm -hmm. married my mother. I'm one of eight kids. Mm -hmm. There's five boys, three girls, and I was the middle girl and the number six kid. So I was kind of squashed down in the middle mm -hmm. in my family. Um, but we lived all over the place. and. I claimed Texas as my home, both mm -hmm. because my mother was born there, and that's where I graduated okay. high school, after all that moving around, San Antonio to be exact. Mm -hmm. So I think coming from an immigrant family mm -hmm. affected my background, coming from such a large family affected my background. My family was very patriarchal too, mm. you know, with the five boys. Mm -hmm. I remember being very resentful of my mother because she used to make me get up and cook my brother's breakfast for school. And I swear, I think every man in my life has suffered since because <laughs> I don't automatically cook for anybody anymore. <laughs> and I love to cook. It's just, you know, resenting that patriarchy. Um, so those were the kinds of things. My mother was a domestic worker, mm -hmm. and I remember swearing to her when I was about 10 years old that I would never work on my hands and knees. Mm. And she said I was pretty sure back then that whatever I did, it was not going to be, you know, doing domestic work probably had some impact on me deciding mm -hmm. to major in chemistry and physics in college. Mm. Cause Whatever you did with those majors, it was not going to be on your hands. <laughs> so I must say, I, my first job as a chemist was sterilizing hu huge vats of glassware. So I was like a glorified dishwasher. So <laughs> I probably didn't change that much. <laughs> but um, my mother's family is from Texas. She's mm -hmm. a classic Texan, 
they moved there in 1867 from Selma, Alabama, and they had been slaves on a peanut plantation mm -hmm. in Selma up until the Civil War. So apparently, as legend has it, they went from Selma to Mobile. Uh, my ancestor built a boat, crossed the Gulf of Mexico. We landed in Nacogdoches, Texas. And we're one of those original Texas families that actually celebrates Juneteenth mm. as our family reunion because wow. it was a holiday that meant a lot mm -hmm. to us. And so my mother's family spread out all over Texas. And my father's family, as I said, is from Jamaica by way of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And so all of that made a very rich and precious childhood. I didn't know we were poor, mm. you know, because we were like everybody else in the military. Mm. And Dad was a sergeant with um, a lot of kids. And Uncle Sam does provide in a way. You know, mm. we never really suffered for food or suffered for health care because mm -hmm. that was provided. But I did remember being very resentful that they couldn't afford to give me braces to fix my gap. Oh. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but, and I turned out to have been kind of like a childhood intellectual, not knowing why. I actually found out recently that I've always been allergic to the sun and to heat. Mm -hmm. And I went to my dermatologist and they told me that I was allergic to the sun. And I called my mom and I said, Mom, do you know I'm allergic to the sun? And my mother said, you didn't know? <laughs> I was like, no, ain't nobody ever told me this one. She said, when you were a baby, I couldn't put you outside in your carriage because you mm -hmm. got heat stroke. So why do you think you were inside reading all the mm -hmm. time when the kids mm -hmm. were outside playing? I was like, I thought it's because I like to read. She said, no, nah, you couldn't go outside. It's, uh, those are childhood things that I remember. Very religious family, mm -hmm. very conservative family. Uh, my father, which is kind of special, was Elvis's drill sergeant when he was mm -hmm. stationed, I believe, in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe my dad when he was telling this tall tale, what I thought was a tall tale. And it wasn't until we were at his funeral and his army buddies validated mm -hmm. the story that I realized that I had not given my father the benefit of believing him during all of his life. So I felt kind of bad at his funeral when I was like, Daddy, that was true. <laughs> you know, anybody could have claimed to be L as his drill sergeant. I thought my daddy was making it up. <laughs> Well, so there, are there any other sorts of um, things, whether it's the sort of family structure or any sort of major events that sort of um, you think, besides, you know, staying in the room and uh, reading a lot, that sort of helped you sort of get more mm -hmm. active? Well, my sister, my youngest sister, Tony, uh, is severely disabled. Mm -hmm. She was born normal, but this was in the 1950s, the days of polio epidemics, mm -hmm. muscular dystrophy epidemics and stuff. And so Tony was apparently born with a depressed or non-functioning immune system. Mm -hmm. So she got muscular dystrophy and spinal meningitis mm -hmm. and polio, I mean, just quickly in succession, like within the first year of her birth. Mm -hmm. And so growing up with a severely disabled sister probably made me a lot more sensitive to mm -hmm. issues of ability and disability. Mm -hmm. uh, we were a crowded family, so yeah. three girls slept in one bedroom, mm -hmm. five boys slept in the other, my parents had a bedroom. And so I recall s sleeping in a bed with Tony up until I was 16 years old mm -hmm. and left home. And I have to honestly swear that that was not at all the most comfortable things uh, because she was incontinent and I mm -hmm. just thought I suffered as much as she mm -hmm. did and that was just totally selfish for me. Mm -hmm. Tony had her cross the bear, and we all had to participate in taking mm -hmm. care of her. And so, from an early age, Mom made us feel very responsible. And as a matter of fact, to escape taking care of Tony, I became a candy striper at a local hospital mm -hmm. during the Vietnam days. Mm -hmm. And so, I had to deal with soldiers who were amputees mm -hmm. back when I was 12, 13, 14 years old. Oh. And it gave me a lifelong commitment to anti-war activism mm -hmm. because I actually saw oh, what yeah. war did. This was not some remote thing for me. And even my graduating class, I came to my 10-year class reunion and there were all these walls of men, pictures of men mm -hmm. on the wall. These were boys I had graduated with who had died within a couple of years of going mm -hmm. to Vietnam. And so, 
now that we're in the middle of protesting the war in Iraq, it, I get a sense of deja vu. Mm -hmm. I also get a sense of frustration because we shouldn't yeah. be having to do this mm -hmm. again. We shouldn't be having to pull our country back from an unjust war. We didn't learn the lesson mm -hmm. of Vietnam as a society. And um, I, 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 I'm remarkably angry about that. Mm -hmm. And I think because I feel mm -hmm. the cost of war. I felt mm -hmm. it as a child and I feel it as a grandmother. Wow. So um, you mentioned that um, you had been volunteering at the hospital, but then you also mentioned that you ended up leaving home around 16. And then, um, then you actually um, were directing you know, one of the first rape crisis centers in the 1970s, but what was sort of happening in between the sort of leaving home or sort of, did you just leave and directly go to the crisis oh, center? Oh no, honey, it was drama, 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 <laughs> getting up from there to there. Um, <laughs> Maybe a short little bit. Yeah, yeah there was a lot of drama. Um, I was a victim of what would be called sexual assault when mm -hmm. I was 11. I was actually out on a Girl Scout outing Mm -hmm. It should be a safe kind of thing to send your daughter on, but I was kidnapped from this outing wow. and dragged into a woods and raped when I was 11. Wow. And so that was traumatizing mm -hmm. enough. And then at age 14, I was being babysat by an older cousin, experienced incest, mm -hmm. became pregnant. I mean, the story is not that unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounded pretty dramatic to me because it was happening to me, but as I later started studying sexual assault, particularly mm -hmm. in the African-American community. I saw it was not that rare. But anyway, so I became pregnant at 14, had a baby at 15, because this was before Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. when abortion was legal, and uh, graduated high school at 16. But by the time I went off to Howard University on a scholarship, I felt that I'd lived a pretty mm -hmm. full life, because I'd had all this stuff happen to me. Now, I was really fortunate in that I did have strong parental support. Mm -hmm. So my family took care of my kid while I went off to college. Mm -hmm. uh, they encouraged me to go to college. I actually had a scholarship to Radcliffe that got withdrawn when they found out mm -hmm. that I was no longer the upright moral person that they had offered the scholarship mm -hmm. to. And how did they find out? Because it was very common back in the 1960s that when girls got pregnant to give the baby up for adoption mm -hmm. and then go back to school and pretend that you'd been on an extended visit with an aunt or something. Mm -hmm. And because I made the decision to keep my child instead of give him, giving him up for adoption, then I became the visible fallen angel. Oh. And my school became very punitive. I actually had to sue for my right to return to school. Oh. And Radcliffe became very punitive. Mm -hmm. They withdrew the scholarship they had offered me. And so that's how I actually ended up going to Howard University. Mm -hmm. At the last minute, I was sending out applications, trying to figure out where I was going to go since it wasn't to Ratcliffe. And Howard offered me a full scholarship. So I went to Howard, majoring in chemistry and physics at the time. And I um, was pretty lucky to have been in Howard at that time because, again, this was the hotbed of students. Mm -hmm. activism. I mean, it was the time of Kent State, Jackson yeah. State. We were protesting the Vietnam War, but we were also protesting racism. Mm -hmm. And it certainly was my first encounter with anything called radical politics, because I'd come from a solidly conservative yeah. black family. And I remember my freshman year in college, people put the autobiography of Malcolm X and the black woman by Tony K. Mm -hmm. bar in my hand, and it was like a universe had opened mm -hmm. up for me. And I quickly decided that I was a black feminist, even though I probably couldn't spell the word at the <laughs> time. But that was the only thing. Actually, we used to call it black pan-Africanist feminist, mm -hmm. just trying to indicate this global consciousness that I was getting. Um, we had a student riot at uh, Howard University our freshman year, we ended up shutting down the campus. Howard was going through its own changes because we got our first, what looked like a radical president in James Cheek. It turned out he was a closet black Republican, mm -hmm. but we didn't know that at the time because he wore the daishiki. So mm -hmm. he persuaded us that he was far more radical than he actually mm -hmm. was. And compared to his successor, he was. But we protested things like mandatory ROTC for the mm -hmm. boys, 
Uh, every woman, though, had to take a mandatory health and hygiene class. Hmm. And we protested that because it definitely sent the signal that black women were both dirty and needed mm -hmm. and went to college to learn how to be clean, which we thought was just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, Co-ed visitation, hmm. you know, there was a lot of things. And at Howard at the time, you had to send in a photograph of yourself mm -hmm. and pass what they called a paper bag test. Mm -hmm. Your skin had to be lighter mm -hmm. than a brown paper bag to be accepted for admissions mm -hmm. unless you were a legacy mm -hmm. admission. And so we felt we had a lot to protest, mm -hmm. both within the campus and externally. We, pro we had to fight for Howard to start black studies on mm. campus. And we mm. thought that a historically black college, asking for African-American studies or black studies shouldn't be that deep. But in fact, it was, because mm -hmm. the administration was like, we're a black school. Why do we need to study black history? Mm -hmm. You know, missing the irony of that question <laughs> totally. So, but it was a great time to be a student mm -hmm. because just by being in class, your consciousness was raised, mm -hmm. you were challenged. Now, we had a lot of professors who were fired for engaging in Marxist thinking mm -hmm. and Marxist teaching and stuff. And so Marxism became like the forbidden fruit for us mm -hmm. intellectually. And so probably we got much more, more into studying radical political, political economics than we normally would have, simply because we were forbidden mm -hmm. to. Um, but taking that, all in, you know, at that time, truly was consciousness raising for me. And when I got a chance to volunteer at the DC Rape Crisis Center, it was kind of like all these pieces of mm -hmm. my life kind of fell, fell together. You know, the early sectional soul, mm -hmm. um, the chance to work in a women's organization. And the woman who invited me is a woman named Nakenji Ture, mm -hmm. and she had been in the Black Panther Party and at the time, I always admired the Black Panthers because I thought they was like the hardcore radicals. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were the dilettantes. They were the real hardcore people. We were in college. They mm -hmm. were on the streets, right? And so when the Kenji invited me to come over to the Rape Crisis Center, I was a bit skeptical because I was like, I don't know if I want to work with those white women. Mm -hmm. And she said, sister, trust me. And I think hearing that from mm -hmm. a sister who'd been in the Black Panthers was enough to make me take the risk. Mm -hmm to go over to the Rape Crisis Center. So more than anything, the Kenji is responsible for me knowing anything about the women's movement because I walked across her bridge of trust and mm -hmm. haven't looked back. Yeah, well, this is um, a good segue. Obviously, we've already started talking about sort of one of the main areas where you work in, which is sort of reproductive rights and women's health. And um, one of the areas that you began being active in in the reproductive rights movement was around involuntary sterilization of women. And um, many people who will view this interview may not be familiar with the issue um, in the U.S. So could you tell us a bit about sort of how you got involved with that and maybe how it connected with the earlier work, such as working at the Rape Crisis Center? Um, well, sterilization abuse became part of my personal narrative mm -hmm. because when I went to Howard, of course, I was trying to prevent future pregnancies. Mm -hmm. I always ready well as a teen mother. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not what they call a good contraceptor. In other words, I couldn't take that birth control mm -hmm. pill every day. I kept forgetting it and ended up getting pregnant again, mm -hmm. having to have an abortion. And so I was seeking a more effective contraceptive. Mm -hmm. And available at the time is something called the Dalcon Shield, mm -hmm. manufactured by A.H. H. Robbins up in Richmond, Virginia. And the Dalcon Shield was an IUD mm -hmm. that ins once inserted, and if your body successfully accepts it, prevents contraception, mm -hmm. I mean, prevents pregnancy yeah. indefinitely. And there was only one small problem. The Dalcon Shield was defective. Mm -hmm. And it was defective for the most banal of reasons. It was a small piece of plastic, a triangular mm -hmm. piece of plastic with a string hanging down. Yeah. And the only reason that string was on that thing was so that the doctor could easily pull it out. Mm -hmm. But the string the string served as a bacterial wick. Mm. And so it was wicking up into the uterus, all kinds of dangerous bacteria, and ending up causing acute PID for 700,000 women, 
it ruptured my fallopian tubes mm -hmm. as well as causing sterilization in, in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women. Ended up in a class action lawsuit mm -hmm. against the manufacturers of the device because they had suppressed their own research mm -hmm. showing that they, it yeah. had this design flaw. And so I ended up being one of the first women to sue because mm -hmm. at age 23, my, my tubes were, had ruptured and I was no longer able to have kids. And it, my, my own OBGYN found all this research data that the company had tried to mm -hmm. suppress. Mm -hmm. And so my lawsuit ended up opening up the floodgates in a way for all the other lawsuits. I know I sound like a litigious person. I don't just <laughs> sue all the time, but uh, when people piss me off, I tend to try <laughs> to get, at, get back at them. Uh -huh. And so my own reproductive career had been so brief. I mean, one full-term pregnancy, one abortion, one sterilization. Mm. And it was pretty much at that point I decided that no matter what else I was trying to do with mm -hmm. my life, my plumbing kept getting my attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I mean, whether it was sexual assault or dealing with, with the sterilization. And so I entered reproductive rights work fighting sterilization mm -hmm. abuse. I mean, putting this in a broader context, it was very common for black and Native American and Mexican American women to be sterilized in the 50s, mm -hmm. 60s, and 70s, so much so that they called it the Mississippi appendectomy. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a case of two sisters who were 12 and 14, mm -hmm. the Ralph sisters, yeah. who had been illegally sterilized. They had just gone in for regular checkups, mm -hmm. and they were 12 and 14 and got sterilized. And so there was a lawsuit bought on their behalf mm -hmm. that ended up creating the first federal regulations against sterilization abuse in the mid-1970s. But thousands of us had gone through the meal yeah. leading up to that. And so a lot of women of color entered the reproductive rights movement, not fighting for abortion rights, mm -hmm. but fighting for the right to have children, mm -hmm. which is different than how middle-class yeah. white women framed the issue. And the first, one of the first organizations that women of color put together was called the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse, mm -hmm. CESA. And then when we added white women to the mix, it became CARASA, the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization mm -hmm. Abuse. And that's where you saw the first 20 of the right to have and the right not to have mm -hmm. a child working within the same formation. But I got into feminist work through my body. I mean, mm -hmm. it was not mm -hmm. an intellectual thing for me. Um, I didn't, there were no women's studies courses at yeah, the time yeah. or anything like that. There were people who were pissed off about what had happened mm -hmm. to us and we were kind of committed to it not happening to others. I mean, I'd already had the child sexual abuse, the sterilization abuse, and I didn't necessarily see myself as anybody's victim. Mm -hmm. I saw myself as a woman who was pissed off and was pretty much on a fight to make sure that what happened to me didn't happen to other women. But I was really lucky to have found a home of, of similarly thinking, similar thinking people at the DC Rape Crisis Center mm -hmm. because that became a hotbed of black feminist mm -hmm. activity in the 70s and 80s. Um, and. Uh, a lot of stuff grew out of the Rape Crisis Center. And a lot of the relationships I developed there, you know, have endured for so, over 30 years, so. So then, um, you were active, though, with the National Organization for Women, right? And you had served as their director of women of color programs in 1985, right? Yeah, so, you have to kind of like fast forward yeah. 10 years. <laughs> then I was active in now. And it was a big challenge whether or not to take the job at mm -hmm. now. I had gone That's to the Nairobi World Conference for Women in 1985, and my roommate there is a woman named Donna Brazil, mm -hmm. who's pretty famous now, because I think she was Al Gore's campaign director. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Donna and I were talking about what we were going to do when we got back from Africa, because neither of us had jobs mm -hmm. at the time. <laughs> well, she was actually the director of the National Political Congress of Black Women that was founded by Shirley Chisholm and mm -hmm. C. Dolores Tucker. But she had a job, but she didn't have a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a job nor a paycheck. <laughs> and so Donna 
told me about how every time a new administration is elected at now, the entire staff has to hand in their resignation and the new mm. administration gets a chance to select who they'll keep or what have you. Mm. So she said, well, go talk to Ellie Smeal because Ellie's mm -hmm. the newly elected, yeah. been re-reelected president because she had been president before and she may have a job open for you. And so I went and talked to Ellie Smeal and that's a whole nother story, but eventually I got hired to mm. be what Ellie thought was the minority rights staff person, and I quickly told her, I'm not your minority. Mm. And so we changed the title to the Director of Women of Color Programs, and we actually shifted the paradigm because Ellie thought my job was to bring women of color into now. I thought my job was to figure out why women of color hate it now. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, I became more like an ombudsman mm -hmm. than a recruiter which I thought was really an important distinction. Yeah, well, uh, many women of color have had strained relationships with women, uh, sort of mainstream organizations, such as now, sort of feeling that these organizations either ignore issues of race or don't see how race is a feminist issue. And so if you could speak a bit more to that and sort of, you know, you've been sort of a pioneer in many cases in sort of mainstream organizations, for example, um, with now in this position. And so if you could talk a bit more about your experience and sort of what your strategies were in working with the organization and sort of you talked about sort of, you know, redefining what your position would be and things like that. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that a bit. Well, most mainstream organizations, to be fair to them, are not intentionally racist. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they don't have, as part of their mission statement, we're going to piss off black women. <laughs> no, that's not how it happens. Um, what they are is intentionally focused on their own needs and mm -hmm. who they see as their constituency. And for the most part, their constituency is middle class black women. I mean, middle well, class white women yeah. who are mostly in denial about their own tenuous class positioning. Mm -hmm. I mean, within the European American community, I see a lot of sensitivity and denial about class issues, mm -hmm. like they're only one generation for poverty, but you yeah. never know that kind of thing. And so they don't fail to represent black women, mm -hmm. like this is some great conspiracy, is that they are representing a small slice of white women and that they're hanging on by their plastic fingernails. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and what you find is that they practice a form of power politics on mm. each other that is very competitive, serious as a heart attack, uh, very much creates a condition of, of brutality mm. with which they treat mm. each other, mm. uh, particularly in an organization like now, which is, you know, by anybody's definition, the most influential feminist mm. organization there's ever been. Mm -hmm. And so for a, a black woman, you constantly have to try to figure out what's the normal treatment with which they treat white women mm -hmm. versus how they treat me. Is it mm -hmm. racism or is this just politics as usual? Mm. And you have to navigate that pretty carefully because you lose all credibility if you call something racism when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they normally brutalize each other and it just spills over on you, that ain't racism. Okay, now if they general, you know, if they genuinely put you in the photo op so that they look diverse mm -hmm. and then they ignore your voice thereafter as they're making policy decisions, that's racism. Mm -hmm. And so you have to develop some skill at distinguishing between the two. One of the criticisms I offer women of color is that we generally throw that charge of racism around pretty loosely without doing our homework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we lose a lot of credibility using it badly. Mm -hmm. And we sell wolf tickets. Well, we're going to boycott you if you don't do this. We're like, yeah, yeah, right. How can a multi-million dollar organization care mm -hmm. about our $35? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we tend to uh, paint all white women with the same broad brush mm -hmm. without understanding the conflicts and tensions within them. Yeah. We don't understand the role of anti-Semitism and dividing mm -hmm. 
white women, you know, all old forms of European nationalism mm -hmm. that are still being played out among white people. We don't even understand the construction of whiteness and what goes into that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're not as sharp as I'd like us to be in understanding how to use and manipulate power within the mainstream movement. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, you know, some of us, like my current work, is into forming our own autonomous movement mm -hmm. because it's exhausting to try to study them I and getting get to that. Not everybody is prepared to be a bridge. You know, not everybody mm -hmm. is prepared mm -hmm. to give up the right to protest personal racism mm -hmm. when you're there to serve a larger purpose. And so that's why I'm into Sister Song now because we get to deal with white women on our own terms, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah, and we will get to that. <laughs> but I did want to, um, you know, sort of know the answer to this question generally, but um, sort of the issues you've talked about sort of with mainstream organizations are also some of the reasons that sort of some of the other women of color that we've interviewed for this project have found the term feminist sort of problematic, and that that's why they don't want to use it or they qualify using it. And so I guess it's a two-part question sort of, First, do you consider yourself a feminist? And if so, um, how does this influence your ability to sort of work with mainstream organizations, or does it influence it at all? Well, I'm a flaming feminist. Mm -hmm. Yes, I <laughs> gladly use the F word and proclaim it in pretty loud l letters, which tends to scare off all the men I'm attracted to. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but it wasn't an accident that I started using the phrase. Mm. Uh, I started doing feminist work in like 1972, 73, but it wasn't until 1985 that I actually mm. chose <laughs> the word feminist for myself. Because I used to say, I'm not a feminist, but, you know, mm -hmm. we used to have a whole classic, movement. Yeah. I'm not a feminist, but this is wrong. You know, <laughs> violence against black women in the black community mm -hmm. is wrong. But I'm not a feminist, but I think this is wrong <laughs> kind of thing. And that was my mantra for so many years. But when I took the job at now, the question was called mm -hmm. because a lot of people thought that I had sold out my black credentials mm -hmm. by taking the job at now. And I had actually women leave other organizations that I'd been a part of wow. that were women of color organizations or black organizations because they thought I'd sold out to the white women. And yet now didn't trust me because mm -hmm. I wasn't, quote, feminist enough. Uh -huh. I mean, I was paying attention to the anti-apartheid movement and to black politics. I, like I said, I was a pan-Africanist mm -hmm. feminist in my kind of mind. And so I wasn't totally into the gender thing as much as they thought I mm -hmm. should be. I was, thought I was into gender, felt I was a good gender advocate, but gender at the intersection of race, class, yeah. nationalism, and all those other things, not just gender in and of itself. You know, I never had the illusion that women united will do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, but I always never believed in angels or devils either, any, either way. You know, so I was a bad fit for them in that way, and yet I was in the black nationalist movement raising all these embarrassing gender questions. So they thought I'd sold out to the white women, mm -hmm. and the white women thought I hadn't sold out enough. So it was an interesting time. But when it was time to mobilize for the first march, the 86th march, mm -hmm. I had the job of going around to all these women of color organizations and talk about abortion rights. And a couple of them kept asking me, well, are you a feminist? And at that point, I'm not a feminist, but wasn't making sense anymore. Mm -hmm. How can I organize women to participate in a movement I'm afraid of claiming? And at the time, Alice Walker had written her first work on womanism, so mm -hmm. a lot of black women were using the term womanism, but that same, felt like cheating to me. It's like, I want all the benefits of the feminist movement, but I don't want the baggage. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to, you know, for me, you have to fight the baggage. You have to, if you're gonna get the benefits, then you have the responsibility of fighting the baggage. And um, now womanism has since evolved in definition. I tend to see people who are womanists now as adding a decidedly spiritual component mm -hmm. to feminism, that feminism being far more secularly oriented. But at the time, it was more like half-hearted feminism. Mm -hmm. I'm into gender politics, but 
kind of thing. But yeah, I'm a feminist and mm -hmm. kind of proud of it. And, and I'm a feminist that likes macho men, so that's a whole other contradiction. <laughs> Which we, yes, we talked <laughs> we about, talk that about that a bit that. last yeah, night, yeah, didn't yeah. we? <laughs> so um, you left now, but then in uh, 2004, um, you were involved with the March for Women's Lives, right? Which now was one of the sort of major sponsors of, and you were actually a national co-director for it. So how did you come to be involved with the march, and sort of what was that experience like? Therein lies a tale. <laughs> I left now in 1989 to go work for the National Black Women's Health Project because mm -hmm. I'd worked within white feminist organizations, so I wanted to go see what black feminist mm -hmm. work looked like and enjoyed that. Then I did anti-Klan work monitoring hate groups, mm -hmm. trying to explain to my mother why a black woman was going to Klan rallies. Um, and then got into human rights work. As part of my human rights work, we founded this organization called Sister Song, which mm -hmm. is a women of color reproductive health organization. And Sister Song was basically founded by women of color working in the reproductive health field who were tired of trying to fix the mainstream mm -hmm. and get them to understand what our women of color perspectives, issues, needs are. Mm -hmm. We were like sisters doing it for themselves. Yeah. We are going to organize our own. And so at our 2003 national conference, the four organizations who decided to do the march, National Organization for Women, the Feminist Majority mm -hmm. Foundation, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, and NARAL Pro-Choice America, sent representatives to Sister Songs Conference mm, okay. asking for our endorsement. And it was obvious why they came to us. We had 600 women of mm -hmm. color together at our national conference, the biggest gathering of women of color ever on reproductive health issues. And when they first asked for our endorsement, I was the first one to say, hell no. Been there, done that, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. You know, I've moved on and the last thing I want to do is, is drop everything we're doing yet again for white women in their mm -hmm. agenda. And fortunately, there were other women within Sister Song that said, hey, Loretta. And young, it was the younger women mm -hmm. who hadn't been through the experiences mm -hmm. of the 80s and the 90s that but let's give them a chance, let's give them an audience, mm -hmm. and let's see what they have to say. And so I thought it was particularly telling that of the four organizations that were pulling off what like they first then were calling the March for Freedom of Choice, they didn't even all have women of color to send to represent them at our mm -hmm. conference. And that was just so unacceptable for me. It's like, I had worked with y'all 20, 25 mm -hmm. years ago. <laughs> over the same question, and yeah. here it is in 2003, you don't even have women of color in senior mm. management. You know, not all of them, but notably mm -hmm. NARAL didn't, mm. and that kind of pissed me off, you know. And they wanted to send a white woman to ask women of color, mm -hmm. I was like, you're Something not even qualified to speak to these 600 women of color as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. Mm -hmm. But anyway, thank God there were other voices at the table <laughs> than mine. Um, so they came and we did a plenary session on whether women of color should participate in the March for Women's mm -hmm. Lives. Uh, the plenary, the, the, the audience, basically came up with some conditions. Mm -hmm. They said, That's first it. of all, that the name of the march had to change because the March for Freedom of Choice was not a big enough thing mm -hmm. for what we're talking about because I talked about you know, abortion or not to abort. Mm -hmm. That is not how women of color organize because we feel that not only do we have to fight for the right to have a child, but we have to fight for the right to parent the children that mm -hmm. we have. If you look at the foster uh, care yeah. system, the criminal justice system, the zero tolerance policies, mm -hmm. kidding, kicking our kids out of school, I mean, reproductive right. rights means a whole lot more than to abort or not to mm -hmm. abort as far as we're concerned. So the March for Freedom of Choice wasn't working as a title. Mm -hmm. We wanted women of color to be added to the, to the March Steering Committee, which is the decision-making body. And that was pretty important because every one of those steering committee seats required a commitment of a quarter of a million dollars to see the march. Wow. So for NARAL to sit at the table, they mm -hmm. had to put up a quarter of a million dollars. Planned Parenthood, now Feminist Majority, there, to put together the first million dollars mm -hmm. to organize the march. And so when we demanded that women of color should be allowed to sit at the seat at the table, we knew those women of color weren't going to put up a quarter million dollars <laughs> to get those seats. As a matter of fact, the cash flow flow was going to reverse itself. Because for women of color, 
organizations to drop what they're doing to participate mm -hmm. in it, their time has to be bought. Because we're talking about organizations with three to four staff people. Mm -hmm. So if they send somebody to sit at the yes, steering sir. committee, the organization's going to suffer. And we had detailed this in our book on divided mm -hmm. rights, how when we try to work in coalition with the mainstream, the mainstream benefits and we don't. So we were mm -hmm. clear about that. And so that was, so getting women of color onto the steering committee was one of our demands. And then broadening the focus of the march was a third set of demands. And much to my amazement, they called our bluff. <laughs> they changed the name of the march. Mm -hmm. They added the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health and the Black Women's Health Imperative to the steering committee, which actually ended up bringing in the ACLU as the seventh mm -hmm. steering committee partner. And then they started reorganizing the march using our reproductive justice language that Sister Song mm -hmm. had pioneered. And so then after they called our bluff and they asked me if I would be the March co-director, I felt like, oh, sh <laughs> okay, <laughs> now, you know, which I had not intended on doing. I was like, you know, winding back in my personal history, mm -hmm. 25 years to work with the same people, you know, Ellie and Kate and Gloria that I'd left 25 years ago uh, to work with them again. But it really did work out very, very well because it generated a discussion amongst the mainstream about the human rights framework, mm -hmm. which is what we wanted them to do, you know, which is the basis of the reproductive justice framework. And it brought in a lot of new voices that historically had not supported a women's rights march. I mean, for the first time in its 95-year history, the NAACP endorsed mm -hmm. the women's rights march. It had never done so. You know, La Raza, Maldef, I mean, just you know, the immigrant rights movement, the anti-war movement, the mm -hmm. anti-globalization movement, all coming together to support a women's rights march. And I think it was because of our insistence that they use the human rights reproductive mm -hmm. justice framework as the organizing base. And so it paid off. I mean, it was by far the biggest march we ever mm -hmm. thought we were going to pull off. I think it had 1,150,000. Mm -hmm participants there and I think this the sad part is though despite the success of the march the four mainstream organizations that started mm -hmm. all of this mess I think they saw diversifying the organizing as a great way to mobilize for the march but I don't think they saw it as a great way to transform the mm. movement into the future because immediately after the march they went back to business as mm. usual which is, you know, something Sister Song could have predicted that they did. We hope they well, figured it out, but they didn't. And, um, you know, they've somewhat lost the potential for mm. using the women's human rights framework as a way of building new movement. But that's what Sister Song is doing. So we went back to our business, mm -hmm. which had been delayed by a year yeah. because of the march organizing. Well, that's actually I mean, a good segue into um, the sort of next part, which is talking about Sister Song, which, for which you are the national director, um, as we're talking about the sort of um, involvement, you know, started at this uh, sort of conference, so the involvement with the march, and that there was quite a large impact as far as this, you know, women of color being represented in this march, but it starts sort of from Sister Song and the sort of unique way of looking at reproductive rights, sort of going beyond just the issue of choice. So if you could talk a bit about sort of what Sister Song does and sort of how it developed and um, sort of any, you know, basically how it's been going since the march. But um, okay. can you just sort of... Well, a bunch of us were at an AIDS conference in mm -hmm. 1997 in Asia. And at that conference was a representative of the Ford Foundation mm -hmm. named Rena Marcello. And informally, Rena asked us as heads of women of color organizations that work on reproductive health issues what would we like to see done? And a number of us, and I'm saying us in the general term because I was actually not at the meeting. Mm. Um, I was heading a human rights organization mm -hmm. at the time, not a reproductive rights organization. But anyway, we asked, she asked us what we'd like to see done. And a number of us said, well, we need a trade association, a national network of women of color organizations. We've tried to do so four different percent. times. Mm -hmm. And we've never had the resources to actually do so. I mean, the first one was in the 80s and mm -hmm. the 90s and going on. And so Rena 
heard us. And when we got back to the state, she funded two symposia on the reproductive health issues of women of color, one in Savannah and one in New York City. And after our second symposia in New York City, she devoted her entire portfolio, which was $4 million, to right. helping us found Sister Song. And when we first started, we were 16 women of color organizations, mm -hmm. four black, four Native American, four Asian American, four Latina. They came together, and we were kind of mechanical, mm. you know, four, 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 mm -hmm. four, four. We were <laughs> desperate to be balanced and all of that stuff. Um, and we were challenging the Ford Foundation because the way Rena wanted to give us the money based on the requirements of the Ford Foundation is that she wanted us to engage in new programmatic work on reproductive tract infections, mm -hmm. which is all nice and good, but we pushed back because we said, wait a moment, every foundation in the world has a new idea for what work we should be doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we well, have an idea that we need to strengthen our organizations first because most of us, are, half the organizations of the 16 were all volunteer, mm -hmm. they didn't have paid staff, they didn't have computers or fax machines, mm -hmm. they the didn't have boards of directors, financial policies, mm -hmm. I mean, this, they were organic organizations that had come up in their communities, but one of the criticisms we constantly offer is the lack of sustained monetary and leadership investment into women of color organizations so that they can actually compete with mainstream mm -hmm. organizations. I mean, you can see multi-year grants going to mainstream organizations yes. and project grants going to, mm -hmm. to women of color organizations. So capacity building over there, work on RTIs mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so we pushed back. We even threatened to turn down the $4 million if we weren't allowed yeah. to use it for capacity building. And that's what we did. We won that mm. fight. And at the time, another kind of special story was that at the time, Ford Foundation didn't believe in buying computers because mm -hmm. they didn't believe in capital acquisitions, you know? And we pushed back because they told us that as a condition of our grant, we had to lease computers. We're like, excuse me, lease computers for like, you know, three or $4,000 a year for when, when $1,000, you could buy the whole mm -hmm. computer? This was not making sense for us. And so the ability of a grantee to say, hell no, was experienced by Sister Song. I mean, we felt like we didn't have anything to lose. You know? mm -hmm. We were already not funded. What were they going to do, yes. pull the funding? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that actually had a real impact on the Ford Foundation because we found out that there actually wasn't a rule against allowing grantees to buy computers. It was an urban legend. Mm, started yes. by some project officer, or program officer, who <laughs> didn't want to be bothered doing, to do depreciation on computers or whatever. Mm. And so he or she had attached a no computer purchase clause to his grants. And mm -hmm. it just became an urban legend throughout the foundation that grantees couldn't buy computers. <laughs> and once we asked Rena to look into it for us, it turned out it, was, it wasn't prohibited at all. But, you know, Sister Song felt really empowered because mm -hmm. we pushed back and said, hell no. And it turns out that it benefited every foundation grantee mm -hmm. after that who now can buy computers <laughs> and any other equipment that they need mm. to, to, to you know, execute a grant. And so um, we got the $4 million from, Sister, from, from um, Ford to establish Sister Song, which sounds like a whole lot of money, except when you split it, it over 16 organizations for three years, mm, it actually okay. is not. A whole lot of money worked out like the hundred and fifty thousand dollars per organization mm -hmm. per year or something like that. But it did allow us to get established. We've since grown to seventy organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, seventy six as a matter of fact. We've gone beyond the mechanical four 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 mm -hmm. that we started out with. And we've added new populations. Um, in two thousand and three we added Arab American, Middle Eastern, North African mm -hmm. women to our mix. And in 2004, we added white women and European-American mm. allies and male allies. So Sister Song uh. now has evolved into that radical progressive home for anybody who has a critique of the liberal pro-choice movement. Mm -hmm. um, and how does Sister Song make that critique? Sort of what is the framework Sister Song uses? Well, 
the basis of our framework is the human rights framework. Mm -hmm. What happened is that we had a chance as individual women of color to participate in the International Conference on Population and Development mm -hmm. in Cairo, as well as the Beijing Fourth World Conference for Women in 95. And it turned out that our international counterparts are much more familiar with the human rights framework mm -hmm. and they use it in their activism. Where in the United States, we tend to limit ourselves to the constitutional framework of mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade. And so as women of color, we went to Beijing and Cairo and came home wanting to use that human rights framework here at home. And we first coined the term reproductive justice mm -hmm. as a way to marry reproductive rights to social justice. Mm -hmm. We did that in 94, and this was even before Sister Song. But once Sister Song got organized, we decided to intentionally popularize the reproductive justice mm -hmm. framework as a way to express the human rights framework in a U.S. context. Um, and then we started articulating a concept that we call reproductive oppression, hmm. which is those human rights violations that not only keep a woman from deciding what happens to her body, but causes, calls attention to the fact that every time a woman is pregnant, actually every time a woman even thinks she's pregnant because she misses a cycle, mm -hmm. she doesn't actually have to be pregnant to start counting the calendar. But anyway, she is trying to figure out what she's going to do with this pregnancy in the context of what's happening in her community. Mm -hmm. So if she's in a community that lacks access to health care, mm -hmm. if she's in a community that's suffering from immigration raids, or if she's in a community where um, there's a lot of violence and there's a lot of surveillance by the state or by the police, mm -hmm. she has to take all of that into account when she, before she can talk about what's going to mm -hmm. happen to her to her body or whether she's going to keep or not keep the child. Does she know if she tells her partner that she's pregnant, is she going to get beaten? If she tells her employer that she's pregnant, is she going to get fired? I mean, all of these are the calculations that women, all women make, by mm -hmm. the way. It's not just women of color. All women make these calculations. And so part of our criticism is that the pro-choice movement has removed all those other mm -hmm. complicating factors from the discussion as if it's only can I have an abortion, mm -hmm. can I afford it, and is it legal? I think mean, they've just mm -hmm. reduced that whole very complicated woman's lie, life to mm -hmm. that. That's and that is an objectification very similar to what the right wing does. Mm -hmm. Only mm -hmm. they objectify the fetus and, and the woman and, and we're objectifying the woman and the fetus. So I mean mm -hmm. many of us offer a critique of both the anti-abortion and the pro-choice mm -hmm. movement for objectifying women. So anyway, we draw attention to reproductive oppression because reproductive oppression is economic violence. It's, mm -hmm. you know, immigration raids. It's violence against women. It's removal of children from foster, into foster care. It's all of those things, yeah. the lack of affordable housing, the lack of child care, all of mm -hmm. these things form that that quilt called reproductive oppression. And the only way to address reproductive oppression is through organizing people to protect their human rights mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. full panoply of human rights, not just gender rights or sexual yeah. rights, but the full, the right to have a job paying a living wage or the right to receive services in a language other than English. I mean, all of these are human rights. And the other thing that we think distinguishes the sister song perspective from the pro-choice pr perspective is that we offer a very strong critique, critique of what we call the population control movement. Mm -hmm. um, necessarily because of the opposition to women's rights and birth control and abortion by the right wing and the fundamentalists, there's developed what we call an unholy alliance between mm -hmm. those of us who are into women's health and women's empowerment and those of us and those of our movement who are into fertility management and population mm -hmm. control. And yeah, we both share support for abortion rights mm -hmm. and contraception, but for different reasons. Because yeah, right. there are 
parts of our movement that think there's a population explosion, that too many of the wrong people are having mm -hmm. children, and let's reduce those population by any means necessary. And they're responsible for dumping unsafe contraception, mm -hmm. contraceptives around the world and ignoring the fact that it is systemic underdevelopment of these countries that, are, mm -hmm. that is as responsible for population growth as the lack of access to birth control. Mm -hmm. You know, you could convince a woman in a developing country to have fewer children if you provided some actual economic and educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. That actually works, much more so than forcing contraception mm -hmm. down, contraceptives down people's throat and still leaving them mired in poverty. Right. Right. So, so Sister Song brings all of this into that. We offer critique of the population control wing of the pro-choice mm -hmm. movement, which makes us feel good about ourselves, but then has a definite negative impact on our available funding, because mm -hmm. the funders who fund the population control movement are the only available funders to fund the kind of work we do. Mm -hmm. So we actually had a funder read our newsletter one day and tell us that they could fund us if we removed the phrase population control from our newsletter. Wow. So. so then how does... Um, Life goes song, on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what are just uh, sort of a couple of the projects that sort of Sister Song has been working on? Well, next week, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we have a press conference in <coughs> Washington, D.C. <coughs> excuse me, because we're debuting a... Uh, map that we developed in partnership with IPASS, mm -hmm. which is a, called Mapping Our Rights. It's a state-by-state -state analysis of what laws affecting women's reproduction mm -hmm. exist in a state-by-state -state manner. So if you're in Michigan and you click mm -hmm. on Michigan, you can find out all the laws on abortion, all the laws on contraceptive use, mm -hmm. pharmacy refusal, midwifery, lesbian and gay rights, mm -hmm. all of those things in one source so that you're not having to go all over the map looking for what's happening mm -hmm. and what affects mm -hmm. you in your state. So we're debuting the website called Mapping Our Rights next week. One of the other things that Sister Song has to pay particular attention to is missing research data. Hmm. Uh, it's amazing but we live in a country that if you can't articulate it and if you can't quantify it, it might as well not exist. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in the research data from the CDC or the National Institute for Health, uh, National Institute of Health or Office of Women's Health, uh, there's missing populations. For example, all black Caribbean and African immigrants are subsumed under the category African American even though their actual experiences may be very different mm -hmm. than someone whose family's been in this country for 400 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're using skin color to just group people mm -hmm. together without really looking yeah. at the distinctions they should be making. Similarly, for the Asian Pacific Islander population, that represents somewhere between 17 and 27 subgroups. And so you can't easily compare the reproductive health outcomes of a woman from Guam from mm -hmm. Maine to mainland Japan, mm -hmm. which is by most definitions a first world country. I mean, you just can't easily compare, you know, Bangladesh to Japan, mm -hmm. but they're all grouped together, a missing populations. Um, another, another hybrid is Spanish-speaking black women from Latin America, mm -hmm. again, grouped within Latin American women without, or mm -hmm. South American women, without understanding no that, you know, the English-speaking people on the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua may have more in common with people from Jamaica than they have with, you know, the yeah. Spanish-speaking people of Nicaragua. And so we're having to challenge those researchers mm -hmm. to, to, to disaggregate the data, to really look at the data in more specific ways, because if you're working with a uh, a Pacific Islander community, you need data actually on Pacific Islanders, yeah. not data that just groups everybody mm -hmm. together. And then we find that those health conditions that predominantly affect women of color are understudied mm -hmm. by the research institutions. I mean, it, it, fibroids is something that a lot of African-American women have to deal with 
but it's being understudied in the Office mm -hmm. of Women's Health or NIH or CDC mm -hmm. because it's not disproportionately affecting white people. Mm -hmm. So we have to call attention to the missing research data. And so what we do is we publish a newspaper, a national mm -hmm. newspaper, the only called Collective Voices, which is the only one by and for women of color looking at our reproductive health issues. And then we feel that a big part of our mandate is to create spaces for women of color to come together. Mm -hmm. And so we sponsor a lot of conferences and meetings and think tanks and things like that so that women of color have a chance to put their heads mm -hmm. together. Uh, and then we sponsor what we call our mini communities so that all the indigenous women can have a place mm -hmm. to get together and talk about reproductive health issues or all the Latina women or even within a subset of the Latina, we, the Puerto Rican women within the Latinas, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things. Wow, so we're working on quite a few different projects and um, I thought- As long as we don't call it population control, <laughs> some fun. <laughs> Um, something interesting you said was that a lot of um, U.S. organizations, sort of when you went to this conference, weren't thinking of things in sort of a human rights framework, but you had also you had founded sort of the National Center for Human Rights Education, sort of, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that and how sort of that sort of connected with the work with Sister Song, the sort of founding of this organization. And yeah. Well, it was actually at the Beijing Women's Conference in 1995 that this light bulb went off in my head around the human rights framework mm -hmm. because it was definitely the dominant framework that the global women's movement was mm -hmm. using. And I saw Hillary Clinton up there promising that we were going to respect the human rights of women. And then I came home and I started asking people you know, about the human rights framework and almost everybody thought about the tortured prisoner in a mm -hmm. jail somewhere as the stereotype of human rights. Nobody really knew what it meant. And so I actually had a chance to ask one of my mentors, uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian, who was the board chair for the Center for Democratic mm -hmm. Renewal where I'd been working, about the human rights framework. And he surprised me because he said, well, you know, Martin, and he was referring to Dr. Martin Luther King, because he was his field director. I mean, I would never be so rude as to call him Martin. But, <laughs> but he could, because they were best friends. Mm -hmm. He said, well, Martin never meant to build the civil rights movement. And I was like, what you talking about? <laughs> you, know, because, you know, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, civil rights leader, is like one word. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so what are you talking about? And he went on to say, Martin meant to build a human rights movement. Hmm. And he actually showed me copies of Dr. King's last Sunday sermon where he called on us to build a human rights movement and then he was assassinated four mm -hmm. days later. And so I was like, well, why hasn't nobody done this? I mean, why in 1995? Know. Yeah. You know, nobody's done it. And then he says, I don't know. I said, well, certainly we can't fight for rights we don't know about. So mm -hmm. I went on you know, to found the National Center for Human Rights Education to teach us about human rights. I just found out, though, a decade later, Carol Anderson has written this fabulous book called Eyes Off the Prize, mm -hmm. in which she details how the African-American movement of the 1950s, particularly the NAACP, intentionally jettisoned the human rights framework mm -hmm. for fear of being called communist. And mm -hmm. I swear, that's the missing why don't we know about it question mm -hmm. that I asked 10 years ago. It was because it had intentionally been abandoned mm -hmm. in this war between W.E.B. Du Bois and Walter White, which, mm -hmm. you know, male egos, I, forgive me. But anyway, I mean, I don't mind sleeping with men, but working with them is a whole other <laughs> thing. But, you know, the whole movement got set back mm -hmm. between this battle between DeBose and Walter mm -hmm. White, where the NAACP said, we will not you say the word human rights, we'll only say the word civil rights. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay. So anyway, short answer. There are eight categories of human rights. Civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social rights, cultural rights, environmental rights, developmental rights, and sexual human rights. And so my job at the uh, National Center for Human Rights Education was to teach people what all those categories for human mm. rights are. 
and how to leverage those categories in our activism for, for social mm -hmm. change. And um, so Sister Song felt that for us to talk about what women of color need, we need to talk about the right to a living wage, the right to affordable housing, the right to health care, the right to be free from violence. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these affect our reproductive destinies. You just can't talk about pregnant or not. Mm -hmm. And so we felt that the human rights framework was the appropriate framework for us. But at the same time, we weren't sure that the American public would understand the human rights framework because it t does take that intervention to teach us mm -hmm. about it. And so again, we used the phrase reproductive justice as reproductive rights married to social justice. As, as what we mean. Now, we've since evolved our definition of um, reproductive justice mm -hmm. because now we tend to see it as the full achievement and protection of women's human rights. Mm -hmm. So that the labor, the reproduction, the sexuality mm -hmm, of women and girls can no longer be exploited. Um, and the end of reproductive oppression. We've got a lot of discussion papers about it. And in a way, we're, all, we're, we're, we're like doing cutting edge analyses because we're looking at all the old theories of intersectionality, people mm -hmm. like Kim Crenshaw yeah. and Audre Lorde and Tony K. Barr mm -hmm. even wrote about, but we're looking at intersectionality through a reproductive rights lens, mm. the same way the Anita Hill case made us look at sexual yeah. harassment through an intersectional mm -hmm. lens and stuff like that. And um, so that's why Sister's Song is kind of like, it's not only exciting to us as women of color, but it's exciting to white women who mm -hmm. are looking for a radical home. You know, and so that's it. what we've kind of become. So I want to, um, you know, we have a few more questions, and I want to talk about something that might seem like a bit of a shift, but um, even before going to the National Center, for human rights education, you were actually working on the Center for Democratic Renewal, which was known as a sort of beforehand the anti-Klan network. And some would see that as a bit of a shift to go from that sort of work to human rights to reproductive rights. And I'm just sort of wondering if you could talk about sort of how you see the connection between those areas of like reproductive rights organizing, human rights organizing, and fighting the right. Well, actually, the biggest shift was that after 15 or 20 years working in the women's movement, mm -hmm. I got offered a job to work in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And I have to honestly say I didn't know much about the civil mm -hmm. rights movement because I launched my career in the women's movement. And um, I was a black person, but that don't mean I knew about civil mm -hmm. rights. I mean, you don't get it through osmosis or biology. <laughs> you actually have to work. Um, and so when they first offered me the job as program director at CDR, I was a little skeptical because the civil rights movement is still a strongly patriarchal movement. Mm -hmm. And it is an extremely religious movement. Now, I neither believe in the patriarchy nor religion, so mm -hmm. I felt like a bad fit. Um, but I'm glad I took the job mm -hmm. because one of the things that frustrated me about working in the women's movement is I had to work on racism through a gender lens. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're work taking on the Ku Klux Klan, you get to work on racism, mm -hmm. white supremacy. No mm -hmm. lenses need apply. Yeah. You really get to work directly on racism and white supremacy and understanding the interplay between the far right, the religious right, mm -hmm. the ultra conservatives like, you know, the George Bushes of the world, mm -hmm. and then the institutional everyday bigots we have to put up with, mm -hmm. understanding the relationship between those four distinct but cooperative forces. And so it felt like a leap going from women's rights to civil rights. Mm -hmm. But then transitioning from civil rights to human rights didn't seem like such mm -hmm. a big leap. Because mm -hmm. as I say, civil rights is one of the categories yeah. of human mm -hmm. rights. Yeah. Uh, and then bringing it all together into mm -hmm. reproductive justice where I am, it feels very smooth to me, mm -hmm. but I have to, honestly say the five years I spent monitoring hate groups gave me an understanding of white supremacy that I still use today because mm. I actually do believe that a large fight a part of the fight over reproductive rights and abortion rights is about forcing white women to have more babies 
Mm -hmm. I don't think white America really wants women of color to have more babies. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing in our history has convinced me that they suddenly find our children desirable. Mm -hmm. You know? But I do think that they're trying to outlaw abortion and contraception as a form mm -hmm. of population control directed towards white mm -hmm. women, young white people at that. I mean, when you couple sexual ignorance, mm -hmm. abstinence education, the removal of birth control and prohibitions on abortion into one seamless narrative, the only thing you're going to end up with is a lot more white babies from mm. very young women. That's the mm -hmm. only thing that's going to happen with that scenario. And it's hard for me to be persuaded that it's accidental, mm. that they don't know what they're doing. Um, and I think people of color end up being roadkill in that scenario. Mm -hmm. They don't really mean for us to have more babies. Mm -hmm. They don't really mean for us to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. And um, so an analysis of white supremacy is something that I think the pro-choice movement does too little of. Um, they are concerned, for example, that there's only one remaining abortion clinic in Mississippi mm -hmm. But they're oblivious to the way that anti-woman politics is used to usher in an anti-civil rights agenda mm, in Mississippi, mm -hmm. because this is the state that voted to maintain the Confederate flag, too. Mm. And so because mm. of their failure to look at the intersection of racial and gender politics, they only address the gender side without addressing the racial side. And they don't see how uh, the conservatives in Mississippi mobilize their racist vote mm -hmm. using gender issues and they mobilize the gender vote using racial issues mm -hmm. and it really works like it's Mississippi politics have always mm -hmm. worked. But you have the women's movement only looking at the gender aspects as if the racism is over. So and nice. uh, it takes women of color to add that very special analysis to that situation. Mm -hmm. So you've actually written on you know all the sort of topics that we've talked about thus far, and um, when people often sort of talk about scholar activists, they often mean people in the academy who sort of remain connected to organizations outside the academy. But you're you've been very involved outside the academy, and you've also began to publish though, and you've been writing consistently things that are read outside and inside the academy. So just um, sort of talking, thinking about sort of your relationship between activism and publishing, and sort of how you see yourself as sort of scholar, activist, activist, scholar, sort of how that works for you? Well, I'm, if, if anything, I am certainly an accidental writer. Mm -hmm. I did not plan on being a writer, but what I found in organizing communities of color, particularly black women, is that we didn't know our own history. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I had to mobilize black women for the marches in the 80s, mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing would come out of our mouths is, we don't care about that stuff. That's white women's issues, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, wait a moment. You know, as far as I know, black women have always cared about our fertility. We were forced breeders mm -hmm. under slavery. I mean, how can we not care about this stuff? It didn't make sense to me. And so I started doing research to bolster my arguments. Mm -hmm. And I started talking about, you know, how slaves would refuse to have babies for whole plantations as a way of resisting mm -hmm. slavery. And, you know, what happened after slavery was that the black birth rate was cut in half. Mm -hmm. And I started talking about what happened when the black women's newspapers of the time were talking about motherhood at our own discretion versus forced breeding and all of that. And once I started bringing in that historical data, I found it wasn't compiled anywhere. It mm -hmm. wasn't put together. I was having to, you know, do some very primitive historical research to find this stuff because I didn't know anything about primary, secondary sources. I didn't know any of that stuff. I still don't, actually, but <laughs> I'll fake it. Um, and uh, so it eventually ended up being a manuscript called African American Women and Abortion mm -hmm. that I wrote in 92, you know, after about five or six years of research. And that was because of partnership with women in the mm -hmm. academy. I have to pay particular tribute to a woman named Stanley James, who's at the University Wisconsin-Madison, because Stanley brought me up there to give a lecture on black women's activism. And then she was the one that just hounded me till I wrote it down, just mm. hounded me till I wrote it down. And eventually I published mm. it in her and Abina Basia's anthology, African American Women in Abortion. So it's been partnerships with my mm. girlfriends mm -hmm. in the academy that kind of forced me to 
keep writing more so than me feeling like I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. I always cringe when someone <laughs> calls me a writer, and I'm like, I don't think so. I actually do my best writing and proposals trying to keep my organizations afloat. Mm. But I'm slowly beginning to accept that mm. I can, you know, at least do historical research and put it together in a narrative. Mm -hmm. That convinces us that we have a history of organizing and stuff like that. I mean, I would never qualify, I think, as a legitimate historian, but I certainly can qualify as a, like you say, scholar activist. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on activists, mm -hmm. less on the scholar. <laughs> But I am in college getting a degree in women's studies, mm -hmm. trying to add some theory to my 35 years of practice. So eventually when I emerge from this process with a mm -hmm. PhD in women's studies, mm -hmm. then I'll have more emphasis on the scholar than the activist part. Wow, so I really just have one more question, which is kind of a big one, but maybe you could just say a couple words on it, which is sort of, what do you think um, will be the role of sort of young people, particularly women, in like um, developing the path of like women's organizing, and particularly around reproductive rights organizing? What will be the role of young women mm -hmm. and young people? Particularly of color, obviously. Mm -hmm. but. Well, one thing I've learned from a woman Oh, back when I was 21 years old and mouthy and thought that I knew everything. I met this woman named Ruth, I've forgotten her last name, but she had known Mary McLeod Bethune. Mm -hmm. So that's how old she was. And she yeah. had this, you know, blue hair that older black women, mm -hmm. you know, favored at one time and the tight girdles and stuff. And um, Ruth and I were both on the Commission for Women, the DC Commission for Women. And Ruth one time gently explained to me when I was talking about their timidity, I was actually, you know, mouthy and why don't we go to the mayor's office and tell him off? And, mm -hmm. you know, we were under Mary and Barry, so we had a whole lot to tell him. But anyway, and she was like, Loretta, you know, chill. She didn't use this word. <laughs> she basically said, shut up, you know. But, and she said, our job was to open the door so that women like you could get in. Mm -hmm. But if you think a woman like you with that hair sticking out all over your head, because these were in baby dread days, you know, and you know, your lack of polish, your lack of tact, I mean, she didn't say it in this many words, but this is what she said, would have gotten in the door, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. And so our job was to open the door, your job is to kick it open, and if you really know your job, you won't be a gatekeeper keeping other people mm. out. You know, yeah. and so that's what I got when I was in my 20s. So I think every generation has the right to define the struggle on their own mm -hmm. terms. And it's not our right to look back or forward mm -hmm. to tell people what they should or should not be doing. If you are doing your job, you're trying to figure out how to best play the hand you've been dealt. Mm -hmm. And if you preoccupy yourself with that, the rest will take Fine. care of itself. Um, I'm not a believer in second and third wave feminism, mm -hmm. though. That, I get in a lot of trouble for saying that. Because frankly, I don't think the second wave is over. And I'm not hearing anything third wave feminists are saying that is that original from what women of color have said mm -hmm. all along until you make a sharply revolutionary take. Now, if the third wave feminists wanted to do something really original, I think it would be to build the human rights movement mm -hmm. that hasn't happened yet in this country. But continuing to argue identity politics mm -hmm. endlessly mm -hmm. is scarcely not original enough for me to consider it a whole new wave. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, Loretta's personal critique. Um, I don't, also don't think we're going to build successful the, the women's movement if we don't spend a lot of time talking about the role of men. Mm -hmm. Because we're not going to make this revolution by ourselves. Just like black folks could not end racism without the participation of white folks. You know, we've got to figure out how to build movement in which everybody's included and nobody's left out. And so I think we've got to go beyond identity politics mm -hmm. and really focus on our commonality as human beings. But not in some little namby pamby colorblind way. Mm -hmm. I like you to notice that I'm black and I think you're crazy if you don't. But at the same time, you know, I am not right. defined by my oppressions and nobody should be. Well, I think that's a great place for us to stop. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this interview. Oh, thank it. you. Thanks for having me. No problem. Quite difficult. I bow to no man's word.